All right. Story time. You guys up for a good story? All right. Have you ever been in a situation where you had a reaction to something and when you reacted, I mean, you look back at it now, you're like, yeah, that probably wasn't right. But when you reacted, it was the absolute wrong reaction. Anybody, anybody with me? You're like, man, I either, I flew off the handle, right? I like, I just got angry and I couldn't hold it. Or like, well, you did something and it was like, well, that was weird. You know, like, like, oh, that was kind of awkward. Or, you know, you just had this really different response. I want to tell you um, about a story. I'm just going to be a little transparent, a uh, little story time here with Pastor Trevor. Um, a couple years ago, I was with Isla, and Isla is my 10-year-old daughter. I have a 24-year-old and a 10-year-old, and um, she was having a class field trip, and they were going to go snorkeling, and I'm kind of a water guy, and so oftentimes they'll ask me to be the chaperone to their snorkeling trips, and so uh, we were just going to Penny Camp State Park, so before we got in the water, they were handing out all the gear, and they were going through the instruction, and, and the instructor was saying, okay, here's what happens, you know, you've got your your vest and you can float and you know make sure you stay with your buddy and then they posed the question at the very end okay what do you need to do if you start panicking right if you're like if you can't breathe you 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 feel like you're gonna drown you're you're uncomfortable what do you do now the correct answer was put your hands up and and wave to somebody and and get your buddy and tell them that you need help that was the correct answer but so so they asked what do you do if you're in trouble what what should you do and without skipping a beat there was this one kid and and he was he was very much that kid you know that kid right there's always one in the group. Without skipping a beat, he raises his hand, and the instructor calls in him, and I'm sure at that moment the teachers went, oh, no. And, and, and it it's probably is not really as funny as I really think, but, but the way that he delivered it was fantastic. His delivery was exceptional. So he raised his hand and, and they say, yes, what do you do if you're panicking and you need help? And he raises his hand. He says, poop our pants. Now, <clears throat> I mean, who doesn't love a good potty joke, right? Now, just like you, okay, because I'm going to draw you in, right? Okay, okay, right, going down with me. I thought it was hysterical. I mean, like I said, his delivery was perfect. I mean, he just held a perfectly straight face when he said it, like it was the right answer. So what do I do? I start cracking up. Here's the problem. No one else, including the entire second grade class, thought it was funny because they were so used to him coming up with these crazy answers and things. And so here I am laughing hysterically, now trying to catch my composure, and the whole class just like, really? You're like a dad. I think you're a pastor. You're like 40-something years old, like, and you're the guy laughing. So... Very unexpected reaction to something. So I, I say all that and I embarrass myself to show you we're going to look at a story today where we see something happen to a couple of guys and you look at their reaction and you go, that's not normal. Like, why would you react like that? That's not how normal people act in a situation like this. Okay, so if you've got your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 16. And my title for today is Simple. We're in our Simple series. If you haven't been here, you're kind of just joining us, you're on vacation. We are so glad that you have joined us to worship with us. But we're in the Simple series, and simple means um, not uh, anything, you know, we're, we're not saying, oh, you can't apply this to life. What we're saying is we want to give you simple tangible tools to take back and use in life and, and apply to your life. And it's just kind of cookies on the bottom shelf stuff that we can use. So simple, Paul and Silas in jail. 
Now, this is a story that most of us know. We've heard many, many times over, but I want to dig into it, and it was really cool. Um, I'm kind of a, a Bible nerd geek kind of guy, and so when I see things that I've never seen before, I mean, I don't know how many times I've read this story. I think I've preached on this story before, but when I find things that I didn't even know or never even thought of, I think it's just so cool, and that's a testament to God's word is alive and it's active and, and it, it, it speaks to us according to whatever um, you're, you're going through in life and just, you know, that's what God's word is meant to do. It's, it's meant to just grip our hearts and say, hey, you know what, maybe this is something you need to hear right now. So Paul and Silas in jail, Acts chapter 16, and we're going to start in verse 16. So we got a lot to cover today. It says, once when we were going to the place of prayer... We were met by a female slave. Now, when it says we, this is Paul, Silas, Luke, who is the guy that wrote the book of Luke and is writing uh, the book of Acts. So Paul, Silas, uh, Luke, and Timothy. Timothy was with them well Tim, uh, as well. Timothy was this young protege of Paul. So it says, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. Pretty interesting here. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Now, yes, software update complete, blah, blah, blah. Thank you very much. So, here we have these guys. They're going around town. They're in this, this town called Philippi, okay? And they are witnessing, and here they have this slave girl who is possessed by a demon who has the ability to predict the future. Now, crazy? Yes. Okay, tell me again how you believe the Bible is boring. It is not. So this, this girl, possessed by a demon, is following them, and saying, hey, these are servants of the Most High God. You should listen to them. Why was she saying that? Now, was she true? Yeah, she was, she was accurate. But maybe she knew she had a bad reputation. Maybe people knew that she was possessed or something. So what she was possibly trying to do was discredit Paul and Silas, Luke and Timothy. But she was going around following them. But... Um, this just, just as a freebie, the scripture is very, very clear for us to steer clear from fortune telling, uh, astrology, horoscope, all of that junk that is all just a, a realm that we do not want to get involved in. Now, am I saying that every fortune teller is demon possessed? I'm not saying that. Uh, I, I was thinking as I was, um, Coming south today, you, you pass a couple of those fortune telling places and whatnot, and and just just kind of praying. And uh, but but this junk, I will call it, is very real, and Scripture is very clear uh, for us to stay away from it. Um, when uh, years ago, I used to uh, be around town in Key Largo, and most of the time it was when I went to Publix, and I would run into this guy, and he had a very recognizable uh, truck, and I would be like, oh, man, you know, and I, so when I'm in Publix, I'm like looking around to make sure he's not on this aisle and getting my things and going, because he knew I was a pastor, and every time he saw me, he would approach me. And, and he would start talking a lot of stuff about, you know, God and Jesus and things he was doing and things like that. But I'm just telling you, I, I got the creeps. Like, I don't know what it was. I, I never got that um, this guy was sincere. It was just odd. And, and, and I don't know, maybe he was, maybe he was just an oddball who loved Jesus. I don't know. But my point is we have to be cautious of people that not everybody that's kind of speaking Christianese, if you will, is really following Jesus the way that we are called to, just like this servant girl who was demon-possessed. Hey, these guys are servants of the Most High God. They're, they're telling you the way to be saved. What she was saying was accurate, but what she was saying was not sincere. So here's our first point. We always have three points here in our simple series. Our first point is, number one, simple followers of Jesus believe and live like actions speak louder than words. 
Simple followers of Jesus believe and live like actions speak louder than words. And if you want to know a person's true heart and intention, what do you have to do? Do you listen to what they say and just believe it? No, you watch what they do. I I love the phrase trust, but what? Trust, but verify. That's so good. All right, and we're back. All right, trust, but verify. James, uh, James chapter two, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to read them, but um, I love the book of James. I love the person of James. James was Jesus's half brother. And apparently James did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah until after the resurrection. And you'll say, why is that? He got to see Jesus and he's doing all these miracles and things. I'll put it this way. What would your half brother have to do to convince you that he was the Messiah? Okay? Anybody have a brother or or any sibling? Okay? What would they have to do to convince you that they were the Messiah? Probably nothing short of predict and then pull off their death, burial, and resurrection, right? That's probably what it would take. Okay, so that was James. And James was like, yeah, I think I got this one wrong and saw the resurrected Jesus and then became a powerful force in the early church. But James chapter 2, verse 14, he says this. He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Basically, you're a bunch of talk with no action. He is straight up calling this out. What good is it? What, what good are you if you say you're a Christian, if you say that you're, you know, you're all about Jesus, but I can watch you and there is nothing to back it up. He's saying it's no good. He said, can such faith save them? Now, he asked that in a question form. I don't think he was asking a question. I think he was more making a statement. And the answer is no. That kind of faith cannot save you. And then he gives an example. He says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, and then he just backs up and he says, in case you're not understanding what I'm saying, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. That word dead actually means it's absolutely useless. Why are you doing it? If you're just a bunch of talk, if, you're, if there's nothing, no action backing it up, your faith, that type of faith is useless. It's dead. Simple followers of Jesus believe and live. That's the key. And live like actions speak louder than words. Verse 18. She kept this up for many days, which is so perplexing to me, like Paul let this go on for many days. Finally, here it is, Paul became so annoyed. I love that we get to see like the Apostle Paul. He just got annoyed. I love that. Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. When her owners, because remember, she was a slave girl, when her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone by her fortune telling, they seized Paul and Silas, not Timothy and Luke, but just Paul and Silas, and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Now, was that true? No, that was completely false. But now they're, they're just making up these charges so they can get rid of these guys because they're so mad at them. Verse 22, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods after they had been, what's that next word? Severely flogged. They were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Now, again, here's, here's some more of that stuff that really helps if, if we understand. In Jewish law, they had a law where someone could not be flogged or whipped more than 40 times. They believed like 40 was, if, if, they were, if it was a severe beating, 40 was about that threshold where somebody you could take somebody's life with 40 lashings. 
Okay, so they would normally go to about 39, okay? They would be super generous and stop there, okay? Roman law, there was no such barrier. You could be beaten however many times they saw fit. And so I need us to picture what Paul and Silas were going through, how severely they were beaten. Literally, their flesh would have been just torn from them as they were beaten with, with these kind of like cane sticks or a whip or something, just absolutely horrible, bloody messes. That's what they were going through. Verse 24, when he received these orders, that's the jailer, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. So now, not only are they severely beaten, but their feet are in stocks. They're, they're in these like shackles that are rubbing up against them raw, and possibly they were, they were hit there and struck there and had just these open wounds and sores with this metal or leather just rubbing on them constantly. Are you, are you guys getting the picture? This was awful. This was absolutely awful what they were going through. And then there's verse 25. Here's the part that doesn't make sense. Here's the reaction, the whole reason why I told you that story in the beginning. Here's the reaction like, Paul, Silas, what, what are you thinking? Like, what do you, what? No, nobody acts like that. You didn't have to act like that. But they did. Verse 25, about midnight, so long day, right? About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Okay. I must admit, I would be praying too. I don't know if I would be singing, you know, praise songs. I exalt thee. Probably not, okay? I'm just, just being honest. I would be praying. My prayer would probably be much different. My prayer would probably be something like Psalm 58, David was usually pretty honest in his prayers. Psalm 58, 6, just this one verse says, Break the teeth in their mouths, O God. Lord, tear out the fangs of those lions. That would be my prayer. Now, I am really glad that we have a mature God, obviously way more mature than I am, okay, that can take my prayers just like he took David's prayers, process them, know what my true heart is, and that's why I would pray that prayer, and that's why David prayed those types of prayers, because just, just newsflash here, God already knows what's in your heart. So when you bring that out, you just throw everything out at God, and God knows to take whatever it is that he wants to do within his will and use it. I'm so glad that that's what God does, and he often doesn't answer our prayers. But anyway, that would have been my prayer. But this brings us to our second point. Number two, simple followers of Jesus praise God no matter the storm. No matter what. Just like Paul and Silas, sitting in this prison, they were praising God no matter what, no matter their circumstance. Now listen, Arrested, thrown into prison, that's bad. Never been there before, okay? By the way, it was nasty. I'll ask you a question. Do you think that they gave them uh, a specific allotment of time for potty breaks? Speaking of potty humor. Do you think they gave them bathroom breaks? No, okay? So chained up, you gotta do what you gotta do, okay? That's their situation. Beaten severely, flesh torn open, put into the stocks, not knowing their future, because this could go real south real fast, and it was midnight. That's a long day. I don't know about you, but by the time all of that stuff would have happened to me being about midnight that late in the day, I don't have the best of attitudes, you know, after all of that, but yet Paul and Silas were just praising God no matter the storm. Now, if this perplexes you and it perplexes me, how they could possibly do that? Like, we're like, Paul, Silas, I mean, come on. You have every right to be upset. And, and they, had, they had an ace in the hole that they hadn't even pulled yet. We'll see that here in a few minutes. But like, 
Why in the world would you act like this? How, or, or I guess a better question is, how? How could you act like that? How could you keep that perspective? How could you still praise God no matter what? Well, here's just a few things I came up with. How about forgiveness? How about Paul and Silas knew that no matter what, they had forgiveness. Like, was it really horrible, the situation that they're in? Yes. But let's think about it. Without forgiveness, this is just a night or a circumstance. Without forgiveness, there is an eternity of pain and suffering and, and, and being without your Savior. That's probably a little bit worse than being thrown in a Philippian jail, right? So there's forgiveness. With that comes salvation. That's a pretty good reason to praise. By the way, none of us deserve it. None of us have earned it. It's a free gift, but it was given to them and it's given to us. How about the blessings that they may have had previously and will get in the future? We have a lot of blessings. Uh, we live in the greatest nation ever in history. That's a pretty cool deal. Here's just a couple of simple little ones. How, how about the air that you are breathing right now in this moment. Is that something to be thankful for? You, you'll say, yeah, 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 I'm very thankful for the air. Let, let's, let's have a little fun here. Imagine right then there was no more air in here and you started gasping for air. What would you probably start doing first? Praying to God for air. That's how dependent you are. That's a blessing by God. You say, oh, air is not a blessing by God. Yeah, it is. Everything is a blessing from God. That's how they were able to praise God no matter the storm. Psalm 103, verse 1, it says, Praise the Lord, my soul. Now, here's another David prayer, but it's a little different from the other ones. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. When is it easy to forget God's benefits? when you're rotting in a jail cell, not knowing your future, in pain and suffering. That's when it's easy to forget. But he says, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. I think David had it right that time. Number two, simple followers of Jesus. Praise God no matter the storm. Now check this. Back to verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And what's that next line there? And the other prisoners were listening to them. This is wild, church. Verse 26. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake because their singing was so bad, right? No, okay, I got off a little bit. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Here's what I love about this. I love that God uses natural circumstances like an earthquake to produce supernatural circumstances. Now, earthquakes are kind of normal. An earthquake right there in that very moment, eh, probably ordained by God. Prison doors flying open and chains just magically falling off of their, their arms and their feet, mm, that's not normal. But here, God is using somewhat of a natural event to bring about supernatural circumstances. Verse 27, the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he had fallen asleep at his watch, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. Now, again, let me explain this a little bit. Under Roman law, if you were a prison guard and someone got out during your time, like they escaped on your watch, you either took their place in their punishment or you were put to death. Now, let's look at this guy's circumstances. This was a whole jail. There were other prisoners in there. So Paul, Silas, 
who obviously these guys, you know, the, the uh, magistrates did not like. And then whoever other prisoners were in there too, there's no telling what they did. He would have had to assume all of their penalties. This guy knew he was toast. He's, he woke up, the doors were open, everybody's escaped, that's it. So what does he do? He draws his sword out of his sheath and he's about to end it himself because he's like, listen, they're going to kill me. They're probably going to torture me as well. So you know what? I'm just going to take care of this now. That's the situation that he's in. Verse 28, but Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. What are those next four words? We are all here. Whoa. Whoa. Everybody, not just Paul and Silas, but all of the other prisoners who had opportunity to escape did not leave. I've never really caught this before. That is influence. That is Paul and Silas using what God has given them in a way, just this situation, in a way that Everybody around within earshot, because it says all the prisoners were listening to them praying and singing. That's the influence that Paul and Silas had. Verse 29, here it is even more. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Wow. Wow. Number three, simple followers of Jesus use their testimony as a tool. We are called to do this, church. We are called to use the testimony that God has given us, whatever situations, your experiences in life, the things that you have gone through, the things that you have overcome. God calls us to use our testimony as a tool to be able to witness and further his kingdom. Here's something else I had never caught before studying this week. It is quite possible that this jailer, who was now in front of them, trembling, shaking, begging for what they had, was the very same person that beat them. You probably never thought of that before, have you? At the very least, and, and I, we don't know this, I'm kind of speculating, but there wasn't probably a whole lot of guys around doing this. At the very least, he was probably involved in it. But he very well may have been the guy that beat them himself. That's using your testimony as a tool. And their actions demonstrated Christ in such a way that this guy's like, hey, whatever you have, I want it. He's like, I, I see your circumstances. I know what you're going through. Like, like, like I, I see your pain, what you're in. If you can have joy and hope in that, I want that. And again, church, that's using your testimony. Matthew 5, 16, I love this verse. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We have to live in a way that everything that we do reflects Jesus. We talked about this last week. We talk about this pretty much every week, right? Everything that we do must reflect Jesus. That's what we are called to do, to use our testimony. And when we're commanded to live that way, people see it. I, I, I was kind of thinking, every believer should have a life mission statement. Every believer should be like, when you, you ask somebody who calls themselves a Christian, they ought to be able to say, hey, as, as far as your faith goes, what are you all about? Why do you do what you do? Here it is. Here's what it ought to be, to glorify Jesus in a way that it draws people to him. Hey, why did, why did, why did you act like that in the prison? I mean, they, they're like, you, like, I would have been mad, but you weren't. Oh, because my whole goal is to glorify Jesus in a way that draws people to him. Well, hey, why did you do that? Because I'm trying to glorify Jesus in a way that it draws people to him. That should be the driving force between, for every single thing that we do in life, church. That's what we are called to do. Let's finish this out. Verse 30. It says, he then brought them out, that's the jailer, and asked, sirs, 
what must I do to be saved? There's that really famous question, the really, really well-known famous answer, verse 31. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, I want to I park on this for just a minute. Just, I, I, I want you to look at this verse for a second. If you're not looking at the context of everything, and maybe if you don't know the Bible all that well, you could look at this verse and see two problems with this verse. And I, I'm, I'm doing this air quotes because they're not really problems. We're going to work through them. But, but did, you, did you see the two problems in the verse? Can you go back to the verse again? Look at it. One's pretty easy. The second one is pretty easy to recognize. The first one, not so much. So let's, let's walk through these. Two problems with this verse. Number one, it doesn't say anything about repentance. And we know repentance is required for salvation. See, because if there's no life change, all you're doing is you're sprinkling some Jesus into your already existing life that is already consumed all about you. And it's like, no, I've got Jesus because I need fire insurance and that's it, but I'm not changing anything in my life. That's not repentance. Repentance is, hey, whoa, Jesus, you, you died for me because you want to forgive me of my sins, and, and I've got sin in my life, and without that forgiveness, without me turning from that sin, I am doomed to eternity in hell. And so, so you didn't have to, but you made a way for me to have salvation. No way, I want that. And by the way, that's going to change everything that I do. That I, I'm going to be transformed, as it says, into something else because of Jesus in my life. That's repentance. So we know that repentance is required for salvation. But see, Paul didn't say anything about repentance. He said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now, what's the second problem that you saw in that verse? What did it say? It, yeah, your household. You and your household's going to be saved because you're saved. Now, is that biblically accurate, if, if the, 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 the head of the home gets saved, automatically the rest of the family is saved? Is that biblically accurate? No, that is not accurate. So we look at these verses and go, um, okay, so either, there's a couple of options here. Number one, uh, the Bible has a contradiction in it, which we know that's not true, so we automatically have to throw that one out the window. So then we have to look and say, hey, what does the rest of Scripture say about this that, that maybe I can reconcile? Maybe, just maybe, instead of rushing to the Bible is full of contradictions, maybe we can go to, um, maybe I don't have a full understanding of what's going on here. Church, I want to challenge you to have that second perspective because I, 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 I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's always going to be number two. Okay, we don't fully understand what's going on. And, and sometimes in Scripture, I read it, I'm like, I, have, I don't really know what that means. I got to look at that because I just, I'm taken back. So here we go. Number one, the repentance thing. Why didn't Paul say you have to repent? Well, look back at verse 29. It says, the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Did you see it? You're like, didn't say anything about repentance, Trev. Okay, let's put it this way. Let, picture yourself as Paul or Silas, okay? I'd, I'd choose Paul. But um, you're standing there, and you had this witness in such a way that this guy, this jailer, who very possibly is the one that beat them, is at your feet, trembling, saying, I, I see what you're doing. Uh, I, I want what you have. I, I, I don't want to live this life anymore. I, I want to live the life that you're doing. If repentance and believe are, are, are the two check marks, you think Paul could look at his list and go, uh, repent? Yeah, we can just go ahead and check that one off. Yeah? You think Paul was thinking, I think this dude is ready to change. There's the repentance. So now, how about the family salvation? Back to verse 32. It says, Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. 
At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. Let me explain to you what was probably happening. It doesn't say this. I'm kind of reading into it a little bit, but technically it is true. Paul was prophesying that his family would become saved. He knew this guy, if he made such a change to, to accept Jesus and change his life, his family was going to see that. His family was going to see that incredible heart change in him and say, I want that too. Just like he saw Paul and Silas live in a certain way, his family is going to see him and his family is going to say, I want that. No way. Like, like, like I want that change in my life. So Paul was prophesying, if you will, that, hey, this is going to be your family as well. Verse 34, the jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. Here it is. He and his whole household. See, now it's kind of the answer is down a little bit further in the text. Verse 35, when it was daylight, now pause. Interesting what it doesn't say. Okay, so everything's going well. He washes them up. He gives them a meal. Paul preaches to the whole family. The family gets saved. The family gets baptized. The very next verse, they're back in jail. Can, can, can you imagine that moment where it's like, man, whew, it's getting late. It's like 4 a.m. All right, we got to wrap this up. Hey, thanks, Paul, Silas. Uh, uh, I got to take you back to jail now. Can you imagine that awkward moment? Like he actually had to go and throw them back in prison. Because verse 37, or verse 35, it just goes to, when it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, and he's all excited, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. And then there's verse 37. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. Paul, what are you doing? Just go, dude. Go. Here's another one of those things we need to understand. It was highly illegal to arrest and especially beat, and especially, especially publicly beat a Roman citizen without due process. It was highly illegal. Here's what blows me away. Is this the first time that we have heard about them being Roman citizens? Yes. If it was me, I would have pulled that card the second they started threatening me. Roman citizen, you really can't touch me. No, you can't do anything. Why in the world would Paul and Silas be quiet about that? I think they knew God was doing something. God was going to use them. That's why they didn't run out of the prison. That's why they were able to praise and pray and sing and be joyful in that. Because they knew God was up to something. It kind of looks like Paul was being cocky. I don't think that's what it was. But I think here's, here's the real reason why Paul said no. They have to come and personally, these magistrates have to personally escort us out. I think it was because Paul wanted just one last thing to put an exclamation point or a big fat bow on top of this whole story because he wanted to encourage those very, very new believers in Philippi. Because there was just a very few of them. This woman, Lydia, that we read about before, she was one of them. It just, just There was a few, probably a very small house church at this time. And Paul knew he, if he could do anything to encourage them to say, hey, listen, don't worry about the rest of the world. When God is on your side, when you've got God with you, you don't even have to worry about it. They can't do anything to permanently harm you because God is with you. Verse 38, 
the officers reported this to the magistrates, that they were Roman citizens. And when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. Yeah, I bet they did. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. There it is. Then they left. Paul was using this as one more thing to say, hey guys, trust in God. No matter what, he is on your side. He can, get, he can be trusted. He will get you through this. So three actions of simple followers of Jesus. Number one, simple followers of Jesus believe and live like actions speak louder than words. Number two, simple followers of Jesus praise God no matter the storm. And number three, simple followers of Jesus use their testimony as a tool. Let's pray. God, thank you that you give us a testimony. God, thank you that you give us opportunity to speak your name into people's lives and your power into their circumstances. God, thank you that oftentimes that you give us great circumstances to do this, and they are not necessarily like Paul and Silas in prison. But God, we know sometimes we must suffer. Sometimes we must go through storms in a way to be an example, in a way to show others, yes, you can have joy and peace and hope even in this circumstance. God, you are the God of hope, the giver of peace. We thank you, God, that no matter what our circumstances are, we can look to you. We can know, God, that you are with us. You promise to never leave us or forsake us. God, help us to rest in that. When we are tempted, God, to turn from you, to turn to our own ways, God, to forget about you, to look to this world for answers. God, when we're tempted with those things, help us to keep our eyes focused on you knowing that you are the only thing that can bring us hope. Thank you, God, that Paul and Silas had hope in this. And thank you, God, that we can have hope in any storm. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If maybe that's you this morning, you are in a storm and you feel like you don't have any hope. Maybe you're going through something today this season in life that you just don't know if you're going to make it out. I just want to pray for you this morning. Maybe you're in the storm of life to where this, this all sounds good, but you don't know about this whole Jesus thing, this, this faith, this being saved, this relationship with God. If that's you, I want to give you an opportunity right now this morning to come to know Jesus as your Savior, to have this hope, to know that at the end of this life, there is something else, and it can be an eternity with your Heavenly Father. If that's you this morning, if you don't know that you have that eternity with Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity. Just say something very simple. Just turn your heart to God and say, God, I need you. God, I, I want you in my life. God, forgive me of my sin. God, help me to turn from who I am now and to turn to who you want me to be. Lord, save me. Lord, change me. I give you my life. I accept Jesus as my Savior. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning who said that for the first time, I'd love to know. I'd love to celebrate. I'm not going to call you out or make any deal right now, but would you just slip your hand up and say, I got it right today. I accepted Jesus as my Savior today. Today is the day that I have come to know Christ. Thank you. Thank you, God, that we have hope.
God, I do pray over those who are in a storm right now. God, that you would just bring comfort right now in this moment. God, may your spirit just fill them in a way that they know no matter what, you are with them. Thank you, God, that you are the God of hope and the God of peace. Lord, we pray for this time of offering. May May we be generous as people, generous as a church. God, may we do awesome things in your name, God, that just make people say, why is that church so generous? Why did they help us out? Why did they take funds and do something with it? Why did they spend time with us? God, help this broken and dying world to see Island Community Church as generous in a way that wants to reach into their lives and into their hearts and make a difference, make an eternal difference in their lives. Help us to be that, Lord. God, we love you. We praise you. And it is in your awesome, most holy name that we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen.